What's up guys, welcome to Daily Dose of Reddit. This is your host, Zach, and today's subreddit is r slash Tales of Neckbeards. This story's called, My Neckbeard Boss Won't Take No for an Answer. This is the story of a man who is obsessed with me and a legal system which failed me. I used to work with a guy called Jay. He didn't have an actual neckbeard, but he had your standard neckbeard interests and worked in IT. I originally worked in a different department from him, so we didn't have much contact. However, when my manager left, Jay became my manager, so I had to report to him. I had no problems with Jay at first, but after a few months, he started to make some comments that made me uncomfortable. He would say that he and I had one consciousness, which was split between our two minds. He would say that we are on a different wavelength than other people and that we were kindred souls. This was really bizarre and made me feel uncomfortable. I told him that I didn't know what he was talking about and that I was just there to do my job. As the months went on, he found ways to have even more awkward talks with me. He was my manager, so I had to speak with him regularly about work. More than a few times, he would use the pretense of a work meeting to start speaking to me and then transition into another uncomfortable obsessive declaration. He would start by stressing that we have a special relationship unlike any other and that he wanted to explore that outside of work. I repeatedly told him no, I am not interested in anything besides a working relation and I don't want any contact outside of work. He would look disappointed and let it go for a few weeks before returning to the topic. Then he decided to grope me. While I was reaching for something in a cupboard, he came up behind me and grabbed my butt. I was stunned. I couldn't believe what just happened. I walked away and avoided him for the rest of the day. I took the next day off and reported him to HR when I returned to work. HR conducted an investigation and put a policy in place where he wasn't allowed to speak to any of the younger staff about anything that wasn't strictly business related. For context, some of the staff, like me, were in our early 20s, and Jay was in his 60s. He left me alone for the rest of the time that I worked at this company. Company. I thought this issue was behind me, but that changed once I left the company. Jay would text me asking me to meet up and attend events together. As always, I said no, we were only work colleagues, and now that I no longer worked at that company, there was no need to stay in touch. He sent me the longest essay of a text I have ever seen, insisting that we were meant to be together and that we're two halves of the same consciousness. He insisted that I was making a mistake by rejecting him and that I was hurting both of us. I told him to leave me alone and I blocked his number. Then he sends a Christmas card to my house. Next, he sends flowers and gifts to my house for my birthday. I reported him to the police. The police officer I spoke to called him and told him to leave me alone. He didn't listen. I am 90% sure he came to my house that Halloween and took photos of me. We had one adult trick-or-treater dressed like a monk with a totally black face mask covering everything. No eye holes, even. This person didn't approach me. They just stood in the middle of the street taking photos of me while I gave out candy. I'm 90% sure that this was Jay, but I didn't want to confront him and cause a scene in front of my whole neighborhood. A few weeks later, I found a letter in my mailbox with the photos this person had taken of me. The envelope didn't have a stamp on it, so it must have been personally delivered to my address. The next year, he sends flowers to my house again for my birthday. I couldn't see any other option but to get an apprehended violence order, or an AVO, also called a restraining order. I went to the police and explained the situation. They said that because I am not in any immediate physical danger, the police cannot apply for a criminal AVO for me. Instead, I have to go to my local court and apply for a civil AVO. Fine. I go to my local court and fill out the paperwork and submit it to the clerk. She reads it and says, You have disclosed a sexual assault? Referring to Jay groping me. This is a crime. You need a criminal AVO. We don't do that here. Uh, you need to go to the police. I told her that I had just been to the police station and they said this was not a criminal matter. The clerk insisted that this was a criminal matter and would not take my AVO application. I went back to the police station, explained what happened, and sat with a new police officer. She asked for all the details of my history with Jay. She wrote everything down and then consulted me with the domestic violence liaison officer. They decided that this was not a criminal matter and that I needed to go back to the local court to apply for a civil AVO. By this point, it was almost five 
5 p.m., so I didn't return to the court that day. I went home feeling really angry at Jay and really frustrated with the legal system. It's like the police in court spent all day playing hot potato with my situation. What a crappy way to spend my birthday. But wait. It gets worse. I come home to an email from Jay. How did he even still have my personal email address? He must have saved it from a time when he had an optometrist appointment and had asked me to buy Doctor Who symphony tickets for him the moment they went on sale. This would have been when I had only just started working for him and he hadn't revealed himself as a neckbeard. The email had two parts. The first one was a long ramble which no one asked for. He said that the last few years had been the worst of his life. He went on to list a bunch of personal tragedies that had befallen him. I don't care. I didn't ask. Go see a therapist. Then he talked about how he had started a new company and needed my help. This company couldn't work without me. He asked to meet me so he could tell me more about it. I responded telling him that he harassed me and that he has a creepy obsession with me, so no, I do not want to meet with him. I reiterated that I, HR, and the police have told him to leave me alone several times. I spelled out that I do not want any contact with him. He is not to message me in any way. He is not to send things to my house, and he is not supposed to come to my house. The next day, I called the police station and told the police officer I had spoken to in the previous day about the email. She said it was still not a criminal AVO matter, but that she would drive to his house and speak to him face to face. I thought this would be the end of it. Yesterday's experience had given me a bad impression of the legal system, so I thought that maybe I didn't need to proceed with the AVO application. I thought any reasonable person would stop contacting me after the police turned up on their doorstep. Silly me. I work in the video game industry, which means that a few months later, I was at Comic-Con for work. Unfortunately for me, Jay was there too. We made eye contact earlier in the day, but he didn't approach me. I guess he's too much of a coward to approach me when my male coworkers are around. Instead, he waited until the end of the day when I was by myself, standing outside the venue and texting. He walks up to me and says, Hello. You're not supposed to speak to me, I said. What's wrong? Why don't you want to speak to me? What's wrong with you? The police told you you're not supposed to contact me. I'm not contacting you. Holy freaking crap. This man walked up to me and started speaking to me, but he doesn't consider that to be contact? That is the most direct example of contact there is. There is actually something wrong with this man. I turned my back on him and looked down at my phone. I was trying to use body language to communicate that I didn't want this interaction. I didn't walk away because I had been heading home and didn't want him to see where I was going and follow me. He kept talking to me saying, what's wrong with you? What have I done? Can't you just tell me what I'm supposed to have done? Finally, he gave up and said, well, at least one of us has manners, before walking away. I stayed where I was for a few minutes to make sure he was gone before I went home. I recently made an Instagram account and of course, who just liked one of my photos? Jay. So I went back to my local court and filled out a new civil AVO application. I left out the bit about Jay groping me because I didn't want to get perpetually bounced back and forth between the police and the court again. This time, the clerk accepted my application. Today, I got a letter from the court registrar saying that he is declining to process my application so he's not letting me appear before a judge because, in his opinion, I don't have grounds for an AVO. Basically, I can just block Jay on social media and that's that. For frick's sake, you pillock. Yes, I can block his account, then you know what he can do? He can make a new account. Plus, because I work in the media industry, I need a media presence, which means that I need my social media accounts to be public. There's no point in me writing an amazing article if I can't share it with a target audience. There's no point in me doing a video interview with a celebrity if the video has to stay private. So this stupid gatekeeper won't let me present my case in court. If I had an AVO, Jay would either be fined and or go to prison if he contacted me while the AVO was in effect. Anything short of that hasn't stopped him from contacting me. But this stupid registrar won't even give me the chance to make my case. Now I dread every convention I go to for work because there's a good chance I'll run into Jay and there's a good chance he'll approach me. On top of which, I'm certain that he's stalking me via social media. For frick's sake, do I have to quit my job, change my name, and never use social media again to get away from him? I can challenge the registrar's decision, but that will incur a fee. I'm gonna do it, and I'm sick of this bullcrap. Update. My second AVO application has been successful. My hearing is 
is set for the 25th of June 2019. I'll keep you updated. Update 2. I've been granted an interim AVO. Jay didn't turn up in court today, June 25th. It appears that he wasn't served the paperwork notifying him of our hearing. This is the police's job. I presented short evidence and have been granted an interim AVO until our new court date of July 23rd. Update 3. We had a mention today and the hearing has been set for August 19th. Jay turned up this time. The interim AVO will stand until then. Alright, well it seems that there are no more updates from her. Uh, I checked her account as well and there's no other posts. So, uh, let's hope for the best and say that it was done. Regardless, that's shameful. Like, that's actually horribly shameful that the legal system did not do its due diligence. Like, that's just disgusting, man. That's just disgusting. It also just goes to show how often uh, people get away with harassing others like this. And um, as far as I know, women have to deal with this sort of thing a lot. <laughs> and it sucks. It really does. This story is called today I flew it up, up by telling a room full of parents that they raised their kids wrong. My uncle died recently, and after the funeral, we all got together with a bunch of his friends for a little get-together around one of their flats. We had dinner, they laid out a spread, and everyone is talking about whatever. I'm sitting on my phone, browsing Reddit. My uncle was near 40, and since all the people there were his age or older, I didn't really feel like I needed to be a massive part of their conversations, being 19. As it tends to happen when a bunch of older people meet, the conversation turned into, remember the good old days? The good old days of being communist, Poland. I wasn't paying much attention since I was reading the story here about the guy that crapped himself while running. But they all started saying that now times are different and every child is being born into a world addicted to technology. This coming from people who use their phones and smart TVs, etc. Naturally feeling a little attacked considering I spent the past hour on my phone, I decided to offer a more youthful perspective. My response was, you're all saying times were safer back then, but it was still a censored state. People disappeared and never came up if they spoke bad about the government. And the lack of internet meant that if something bad happened, you wouldn't be able to hear about it until weeks later. Whereas now, we are able to see and hear information almost instantly. Times were as dangerous then as they are now. Those dangers were just muted because you couldn't hear about it instantly. Their response was, No, kids now are shallow and addicted to their phones. One woman brought up the example that a child was crying in her car, and she offered to bring up Fireman Sam on her phone. To her surprise, he was able to go on YouTube and find it himself. He was a toddler, I'm not sure of his age. This prompted everyone to agree and bring up stories of their children playing Fortnite all day and not reading anymore, not focusing on productive hobbies, and then blaming the internet and technology in general. This pissed me off, since they are doing the same thing they're calling out their kids on. So I responded, Kids nowadays are brought into a world with this technology. They understand it and it's a different culture and climate. It's up to the parents to acclimate to that and be able to modernize their solutions to be able to connect with their kids. My mom instilled good values on me. Although I was raised in a world with technology, I never acted the way you're describing because my mom made sure that didn't happen. If your child is acting a way that you're unhappy with, it's not the child's fault. It's yours. You're the one that's supposed to teach it differently. Everyone went quiet for a bit, then returned to their conversations. It was only when one of the women, assonance, touched me on the arm and said, you know, I'm happy for you that your mom raised you right. Then I realized what I just did. In a country where I'm not supposed to call an elder by their first name out of respect, I told a room full of people that they failed as parents. I know I was right. However, in their eyes, I contradicted that by even speaking up that way. I felt a bit bad, but I had a cigarette and got over it. Not really that bad of a story, just a faux pas since I'm not used to the culture here. Edit. Thanks for all the comments. Whether you agree or disagree with my opinion, I appreciate your insight. Just wanted to clear up the age range. We were talking about kids who are still going through their developmental period, where parental involvement and guidance is key to instill values they will carry for life. Also, my tfuh moment stems from how arrogant I was in my response. However, being part of basically the halfway point between the two age groups, I felt that the rules that my mom used to raise me would be able to help unstick their kids from their phones since they were sitting there acting like there's not nothing they can do. I used myself and my upbringing 
as an example of how to do it right, and at the same time show them that there is more that they can do in order to protect their kids before it's too late. Or, you know what you could have done, alright, basically implies all that in a way that is concise and makes you look like a badass on the internet. You could have just said, hey, listen up. Okay, boomer. Flip down your shades, they have to be black and pixelated, pop on a leather jacket, pull the pin from a grenade, throw it behind you, and walk off very slowly because cool guys don't look at explosions. They turn around and they walk away. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell to never miss an episode.